So just a, a couple of ground rules, since this is a little bit different, I definitely want your questions. So as I'm teaching, there'll be periods in the lecture where I will stop and I will answer your questions as it relates to what I'm um, teaching here. So Ryan's gonna monitor the questions when I get to that point. If we have some questions, then he'll read them off to me and I can respond to them. And if we don't, then we'll just keep going. I have a lot of notes, so I'm gonna do my best to get through these in the next hour. And then if there's a lot of questions in a particular section, I may just wait to answer those, especially sometimes what happens is as I'm teaching, I'm gonna answer those questions later on. So I may even just tell you that. So we'll get through these. And at the end, around 8.30, I'll open it up then for questions and then we can, we can close it out that way. So if someone wants to leave the feed, they can do that a little bit later. All right, so let's start off with a survey. This works better in a crowd, but um, you can throw these up in the comments if you want. But first question is, can you name five spiritual disciplines? So first five that come to your mind, what are the first five that come to your mind? And you can either write them down, think about them in your mind. Uh, some of you that want to jump in the comments, you can. Now, typically, when you get those uh, first ones that come to people's mind are things like Bible reading, prayer. Are we getting some? Fasting, Bible reading, prayer, memorizing scripture, and meditation. Right. So I would say in some order, that's what people's, the list that they come up with as far as these are the spiritual disciplines. Now, I'm going to ask you this following question. What do you believe is the purpose of the spiritual disciplines? Which you'd be surprised, you get different answers from that. Now, when I give this particular question out um, to a crowd, of, let's even say uh, 10 people or more, I have typically seen several different answers. Though everyone's list is not the same, there will be some similarities to them. So the question I have is who's right? Who has the right list of spiritual disciplines? When I was studying this about four years ago, I accumulated, I think I had a, one day I showed it on Ryan, I had this stack of books across my desk. It was enormous stack. And every book that was on spiritual disciplines had a different number. One lady had 150, 150 lists of things that, disciplines that you could, I mean, that I don't even know if you have that much time on a year to do all of those. But here's the question. What is the most important discipline for the Christian? If you believe in spiritual disciplines, what is the most important discipline? Now, the most common answers I've received, I don't know if anybody's throwing them in here. Most common answers I've received is to help us grow in Christ. I'm sorry, I know this is different. Uh, most important discipline, and I'm not, I'm not going to wait to look at the comments. Most important discipline typically is either prayer or Bible reading. Those are the two. And there might be something else in your mind. But if I were to have to pick one, I would say it's faith. And I have given this survey in the last five years, I don't know how many times, and I've never had someone pick faith because they don't see faith as the primary focus of the Christian life. If I'm going to discipline myself in something, I'm going to discipline in myself in making sure I'm resting in the perfect work of Christ. Um, now, what do we believe is the purpose? This is the purpose I have behind spiritual disciplines, to help us grow in Christ, to help us be effective Christians, right? So we discipline ourselves so we can be effective, to help us meet requirements for sanctification. So if you're going to be sanctified before God, this is what you have to do, to earn God's favor or blessings on earth, right? But in my opinion, Christianity has been deeply affected by the teaching of spiritual discipline. So it's changed the way in which we understand what, uh, how the purpose behind the, the one I think is most important, which is faith. For instance, I've given the survey above to a number of people in this last year. And as I've done that, when we finally go back through this list again, really the only list, the only thing you can write down as far as spiritual disciplines from a biblical standpoint is faith. And we'll get to that as we get to, to the very end. So the whole point of this class is to talk about how did this perspective come about where if you ask any Christian right now, what are spiritual disciplines? It's You'd be hard pressed unless they were just saved recently. You'd be hard pressed to find someone that would not be able to give you some kind of a list of this is what Christians must discipline themselves in. So where did this perspective come from? 
Now, I don't know if you guys know that you can do this, but you can go to Google and you can do search for books. And when you search them, you can actually put criteria of what the title is that you want to search. And then you can put what year you want to search them in. So what I did was I did a search from the 1400s all the way up to 1977. And I'll explain why that date in a little bit. And when I did that search, I searched for spiritual disciplines, spiritual formation and spiritual exercises. Those are kind of the different words that are being used there. And in when I when you when you do that search from 1400s to 1977, you come up with about uh, what was it? Six books that are actually on the topic because it goes, it pulls all kinds of stuff. Six books that are actually on the topic. Most of them are not even in print anymore. And they were kind of obscure around the 1960s is where some of them uh, would have addressed this. And some of them were even in different languages. Change the criteria. So same search topics, 1978 to present day. You hit enter and there's over 27 pages of results that have to do with spiritual disciplines or spiritual formation or exercises. So what happened between early Christianity, between the 1400s up to 77 and from 78 forward is what we're going to talk about. So clearly there was an explosion within the American Christianity or American culture and what caused that. So we're going to look at that specifically. Uh, Richard Foster is probably known as the father of spiritual disciplines. We're going to talk about him uh, um, a lot tonight. And he wrote a book called Celebration of Discipline in 1978, which is why I started my search this way. And Foster openly expressed in his article that when I first quote, when I first began writing in the field in the late 70s and early 80s, the term spiritual formation or spiritual discipline was hardly known except for highly specialized references in relation to Catholic orders underline that Catholic orders. So the perspective of Christianity, the perspective around Christianity as it relates to spiritual disciplines, the man who really is known for kickstarting it here in the America says that it didn't exist until after he started writing on it. Right? So in the, my first lecture, uh, which will be available in the audio, I talk a lot about your perspective will influence your purpose. So how you perceive things to be reality will then determine how, what it is that you're going to do as your purpose in life. For instance, if you absolutely believed that the world ended tomorrow, like it was over with, your, if that was your perspective, then your purpose for life would probably reflect that. You wouldn't be live streaming with me right now. You'd be spending your life or time doing something else. So your perspective on the Christian life as it relates to spiritual disciplines or how you relate to God as far as in your spiritual growth will determine your purpose. And we'll, you will see this throughout the writings of men who promote a spiritual disciplines. They believe that we grow before God through means of uh, different means by which we must discipline ourselves in. And our actions in doing these means will then transform us into the image of God. That's their perspective. And it does play out in their purpose. Uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time this uh, evening, but I, I do want to talk a little bit about where the perspective that I'm coming from, and I would say a reform perspective of sanctification. And I think it'll help explain the contrast between the spiritual different the spiritual disciplines movement and sanctification. So I'm going to pause right there. Do we have any questions that relate to this yet, Ryan? No. Okay. All right, so we'll hold off on those until we until we get going. So at this section of your notes, we're going to be talking about the Reformed view of sanctification. Um, so the Reformed view, and there there is some debate in this, and we'll get into that into another time in a podcast, but I would say in general from the writings I'm going to show you here is that the Reformed view is that our justification, which is our standing before God, and our growth, our sanctification, are both by grace alone. So... Um, we're not going to spend a lot of time tonight about is it monergistic or synergistic, but I think that it's very clear that do we participate in our sanctification? We obey. But yet, where does the sanctification happen? It's by faith. It's the transforming of the Holy Spirit within us. Some uh, verses that help us with this, for instance, is Galatians chapter 3, verses 2 and 3 here in your notes. It says, "Do you, did you receive the Spirit by works of the law? or by hearing with faith. So we're talking about regeneration, right? Our justification. Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh, 
right? So are you now, if you are saved by faith, but you're saved by faith, uh, by grace through faith, are you going to be sanctified by works of the law? And the answer to that is no. You are going to be saved by faith. So it's pretty clear. So Paul, in writing the Galatians, asks a very clarifying question in verse 3. Do you Did you receive the works by the Spirit? Oh, sorry, we already read that. I apologize. So just um, the reformers also in their catechisms and in the confessions pick up on this as well. So a couple of quotes here. One from the London Baptist Confession, it says that believers and their ability to do good works is not at all of themselves, but wholly from the Spirit of Christ. So we are not saying there are not good works. We're just saying that the ability to do such works come through the power of the Spirit. And also the Westminster Short Catechism states, if we are not sanctified except by faith uniting us to Christ. And later on it teaches that the Spirit of God making the reading, but especially the preaching of the Word, an effectual means of convincing and converting sinners and of building them up in holiness, comfort through faith unto salvation. So it's, I think it's helpful here. It's saying not only are, is there salvation connected to their faith, but it says their holiness and the building up in their holiness is connected to faith by means of the preaching of the word. So someone asked me earlier before we started uh, uh, personal Bible study versus the preaching of the word. And I think there's a constant emphasis on the public preaching of God's word, which we will get into a little bit later. But this is why the study of historic theology, I think, is important. This is why not, uh, not when we don't pay attention to how theology has progressed, using the confessions uh, and helping us in our theology, we can slip back into theology that was rejected many years ago. But because we're uh, ignorant of our history, we don't know that. So modern Christianity has really embraced this concept of spiritual disciplines within the last 50 years. So you have this large gap, right? So 1400s, all the way up to 1977, really not mainstream. It's slowly starting to seep in, and then all of a sudden there's an explosion. And why is it? So this doesn't mean there isn't a place for good works. I, I need to start this now so the questions don't come. I do believe there's a place for good works. That That is going to come in series three and four. This is specifically about does our good works play in or does dis disciplining our good works play into how we are transformed into the image of God? And the emphasis must be on our faith, not our good works. So to help clarify that, uh, the Belgian Confession uh, on the Reformed Faith says this, Therefore it is impossible that this holy faith can be unfruitful in man. For we do not speak of a vain faith, but of such a faith which is called in Scripture a faith working through love, which excites man to the practice of those works which God has made in his word. And again it states, Therefore we do good works, but not to merit by them, for that we could, for that what could we merit? Nay, we are indebted to God for the good works we do, and not, and not he to us, since it is he who worketh in us both to will and and to work for his good pleasure. So, to be clear, we don't think that the good works are, uh, uh, spiritual disciplines is, if you, if you don't believe in spiritual disciplines, it means you're getting rid of good works. We're not stating that. Uh, so just be clear, and we'll get, we'll get into that in, into the very end. Any questions up at this point? We good? Okay. All right, so. Spiritual, we're going to start from the, reform, the reformers, and we're going to work our way up through history. So from the very beginning, spiritual disciplines were rejected by the reformers, such as Luther and Calvin. So here's a couple of quotes as far as the concept of disciplining yourself for the sake of sanctification so that God would be pleased with you or accept you as righteous. This is what Luther has to say about that. Yet all these seemingly holy actions of devotion are nothing else but works of the flesh. All manner of religion where people serve God without his word and command is simply idolatry. And the more holy and spiritual such a religion seems, the more hurtful and venomous it is. For it leads people away from faith of Christ and makes them rely and depend upon their own strength, works, and righteousness. In like manner, all kinds of orders of monks, fast, prayers, hairy shirts, are mere works of the flesh. Okay, so it's pretty clear Luther did not equate 
um, our sanctification with what we do as far as in our discipline, uh, that the way in which we are sanctified is by faith. Calvin, in, in the same way, uh, in the Council of Trent, in the, sorry, in the Acts of the Council of Trent wrote, in short, I affirm that not by our own merit, but by faith alone, or are by both person and works justified. And that the justification of works, which is sanctification, depends on the justification, which is forensic, of the person as the effect on the cause. So Calvin's point is that we are both justified and sanctified by faith alone, which sounds very similar to Galatians chapter 3, as we read earlier. And then I found this article, you'll find this in the note, helpful by D.A. Carson on the reform view versus spiritual disciplines. He says, it is not helpful to list assorted Christian responsibilities and label them spiritual disciplines. That seems to be the reasoning behind the theology that snuggles, uh, smuggles in, say, creation care and almsgiving. By the same logic, if out of Christian kindness you give back a, a back rub to an old lady with a stiff neck and a sore, a sore shoulder, then back rubbing becomes a spiritual discipline, which, to be honest with you, probably my wife would uh, prefer me to have that spiritual discipline. But rubbing a lady's back, if it's doing it for the glory of God, you could then equate it with, if you're taking the same logic they're giving here, you can then equate it saying, if I discipline myself in this action, then God will use it to transform me into the image of Christ, right? He goes on to say, some of these so-called spiritual disciplines are entirely divorced from any specific doctrine whatsoever. They are merely a matter of technique. That is why people say, sometimes say, for your doctrine, by all means, commit yourselves to evangelical confessionalism. But when it comes to spiritual disciplines, turn to Catholicism or perhaps Buddhism. What an astounding statement. So right doctrine, stay with confessionalism. But if you want to know more about spiritual disciplines, you're not going to evangelical sources to get those. You aren't going to historic reformed confessional sources to get those. You have to go to something that is other than that, which is Catholicism, or of course he says Buddhism. So Dr. Carson concludes that this type of teaching subtly cajoles us into thinking that growth in spirituality is a function of nothing more than conformity to the demands of a lot of rules, of a lot of obedience. So to be transformed in the image of Christ is done by rules, to make it simple, right? Uh, really helpful conclusion comparing Reformed perspective of sanctification and uh, spiritual disciplines. R. Scott Clark on his blog said, Christians without conscious confessional commitments or an intentional awareness of the Reformation tend to be rootless, meaning lacking a tradition of piety of their own. They drift from one new thing to the next or borrow electrically from this tradition and that like a three-year-old's playing dress-up. When those who identify with aspects of Reformed theology, however, borrow spiritual disciplines that the Reformed Church considered and rejected, they are unintentionally creating the precondition for greater problems. Now, this is definitely what has gone on historically, and even in, we're going to get into this, where you have people who claim to be Reformed, but yet they're coming over here and they're grabbing spiritual disciplines and they're connecting them together, and that just is going to create greater problems. So, as I stated before, this is why the study of historic theology is important. Much of what is taught today concerning spiritual discipline has been rejected for hundreds of years now and considered not to be biblical for good reasons. So modern Christianity has only recently embraced this, like I said, in the last 50 years. So how did this come about? We go from Luther and Calvin and the, uh, the confessions rejecting this to it's normal to be uh, practicing spiritual disciplines in today. So over the last 400 years, Christianity has slowly slipped away from a reformed understanding of sola fide or living a life by faith alone as it concerns sanctification and has embraced, I would say, a hybrid of Catholicism with evangelicalism. And this really began with what's called the Counter-Reformation. So during the Protestant Reformation, during the 16th century, Roman Catholic Church responded to the Reformers, and they responded with what's called the Counter-Reformation. And the main thrust behind this movement was a man by the name of Ignatius Leola. So before I get going, is there any questions? 
Okay. <laughs> Shirts. Yes. Okay. Yes, Harry shirts. <laughs> Ouch. All right. So the main thrust behind this movement is by a man by the name of Ignatius Loy Loyola. He founded a group called the Jesuits, also known as the Society of Jesus. But most of Ignatius' writings were attacks against, and this is, please uh, catch this because we're going to talk about Ignatius in a little bit. Most of his writings were an attack against the Protestant teachings of Luther and Calvin. So he is the counter-reformation. He's trying to stop what they're doing, turn everybody back to Rome. Ignatius is most famous for his book, The Spiritual Exercises of Ignatius of Loyola, which is written around 1522. Ignatius leads his readers through a series of mystical ascetic practices, believing they will lead to greater spiritual awareness and growth. Okay, so the whole premise of the book is this practice, which we'll go through some of what his practices are, will make you more aware of your faith and cause you to grow. So Ignatius theology was rejected by the reformers because it openly attacked the doctrine of sola fide. Of course, if he's part of the counter-reformation, it would be logical that he would not hold to justification by faith alone. As mentioned earlier, many of the confessions and writings of the reformers charted a course steering their readers far away from this tradition of the Roman Catholic Church's view of spiritual growth. So how did Ignatius theology and other Roman Catholic teachings on spiritual growth find their way back into popular evangelicalism? Well, it began in the 17th century, so just 100 years from uh, uh, before Protestantism began to allow this to seep back in. And it began to seep back in through some of the Puritans uh, and in their writings. Not all the Puritans, but there's definitely a select group of some of the Puritans who began to grab some of the older writings and even some of that of Ignatius and bring them into the practice of the church. Um, church American church history historian Charles Hambrick Stowe observed, quote, Puritans knew and used classic Catholic devotional works. The most popular, judging from the number of edits, were the works of St. Augustine, St. Bernard, Thomas Akempis, and the, uh, his perennial, The Imitations of Christ and the Primers. And then later on, um, historian Richard Lovelace talking about the Puritans and what they did with the Catholic works, he quoted, or sorry, he wrote, it is not surprising that some Puritans, some Puritan writings are saturated with references to patristic authors. There are more references to the fathers than to Luther and Calvin. Puritanism, as it relates to sanctification, just to be clear, uh, Puritanism is thus a bridge movement in modern evangelicalism and Roman Catholics may find spiritual common roots. Cotton Mather's omnivorous spiritual appetite smuggled in many Catholic devices, such as short ejaculate prayers, vows and attentions of piety, and day and night long vigils, or depriving yourself of sleep. So it's no, I think it's noteworthy to mention that the early writings of the Reformers never really mentioned spiritual disciplines or spiritual formation, as far as that word or that con the actually using spiritual disciplines. But the, 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 they allude to the concept of it, uh, the, this, the Puritans of the 17th century allude to the concept of it. And there's another quote here by Richard Lovelace. Um, I'll let you read that just to save time. But in this, he, he historically accounts that the concept of quiet time, where you're going to sit down by yourself and uh, read as a requirement. Like, in other words, as a Christian, you're required to have a quiet time in order to grow in Christ. Uh, that comes to us by... Uh, men like Cotton Mather, and even uh, required prayer for meals and things like that. So now listen, I don't believe that any of these are actions are sinful or unbiblical. So reading your Bible in, in, by yourself, praying by yourself, which is actually commanded in Scripture to, to pray by yourself. But in, in any of these other fasting, um, even spending time alone is not bad. Do you, we have a question? We got two questions. All right, we'll, go, we'll take a pause here. And who's the question by? Um, do, which one? Can you just give me their name, Ryan? Luis and Bernie. Okay. Um, I have been taught that fasting is an intentional choice to deny the flesh, to focus on the spirit. Purposes is to grow faith. Where does this cross the line, and how do we define the line? Uh, and then, so an all-night church prayer meeting isn't reformed. <laughs> 
All right. Uh, well, I wouldn't say an all night church prayer meeting is not reformed because they did it in the book of Acts when they're praying for Peter to be released. So apparently the church in Acts wasn't reformed. Uh, no, I'm not saying that. Uh, all right. Two things. Uh, we'll, and this, I'll jump a little ahead in the notes. The, uh, your faith, if we're to define faith and prayer, both of them are acts of dependence, right? So if you say, I have faith in Jesus, you aren't just saying, I have faith in his existence. Salvation is dependence upon Jesus for his death, burial, and resurrection, and his life, right? So to have faith in the gospel is to fully depend upon Jesus. And prayer is also a dependence upon him. You are coming to God, and you are depending upon him for, if it's even if it's just in his praise, you are depending that, giving him praise, that that, that is true of him, but then there's also requests. When it comes to fasting, I think fasting absolutely can be beneficial. And in Scripture, it was done as a means to focus one's dependence. Where I, there is a, There's a side of it where you're going to stop and focus your attention and prayer into depending upon God for either if it's wisdom or clarity, um, um, or if there was, there, was, there was a moment of maybe even confession. So it's dangerous to think that fasting equates more spirituality. Like if I do this, then I will be a more spiritual person. I think we have to also be careful that fasting is always connected to eating. I think that it's it's there are times even within um, my week, there are times where I'll fast. And it has nothing to do with because I'm trying to be more of a spiritual person. But there are things I'm trying to think through and I'm trying to 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 gain wisdom from God. So it's just like if for this for, for today, I'm going to set aside this meal. I'm going to use that time to depend upon God for something. I'm not doing that because I'm trying to become a more spiritual person. I'm doing it out of necessity. I feel the need to do this because I'm weak and frail and sinful. I have sin that clouds my mind and my heart at all times. So, But I don't feel like it's, if you don't do that, then you're less of a Christian. If you Because there's it's not very clear on fasting. I mean, it, it, there's nowhere in the Bible that says, this is how much you must fast. This is when you should fast. It's It's left open. And I think it's, left open for, for a reason. Um, and we tend to turn it into a law. So great question. Uh, all night prayer meetings. No, I think it's, uh, again, if you understand what prayer meetings are for, for the dependence of God um, and, a, and a church decides that they want to do that, if they understand that um, the more time they spend in prayer doesn't necessarily mean it's going to change God's heart and mind, but it may end up helping them depend and change their own heart and mind as far as in trusting in God. There's a whole nother discussion. Uh, Pilgrim's Guide to Rest, chapter five, I write on prayer. You might want to, you might find some helpful information there. Okay. Any other questions? Doesn't look like it. I completely lost. Oh, here we go. Now, uh, I will admit that it can be difficult at times to see how the Puritans' teaching is harmful or wrong. Because how can you say reading your Bible is wrong or praying is wrong? And I'm not, like I said before, I'm not saying that that's the case. But most Puritan theology, if they're picking up this language, is leading us towards a dependence upon self and self-performance. So it's faithfulness, as we say with the Theocast, it's faithfulness instead of faith, right? So we're putting the do before the done, which is which is dangerous. So as we continue to move through history, the concept of external efforts leading to spiritual growth gains traction, but Roman Catholic theology is never really overtly embraced. So you're, you're not going to see it. You're not going to see people overtly push you towards a Rome, but it does seep in and it seeps in with authors like Richard Foster, Dallas Willard, which we're going to see here shortly. All right, so let's keep moving forward. So you have uh, Ignatius, who really starts really popular. His book is still being published today um, after 500 years. Then you have, or 400 years, then you have the Puritans who begin to dabble in it. And then it begins to influence big time influencers like Jonathan Edwards. So everybody has heard of Jonathan Edwards. And during the 18th century, Americans were deeply influenced by Jonathan Edwards, especially, for instance, his 70 resolutions. Uh, if you've not read through the resolutions of Jonathan Edwards, you probably should. And just ask yourself this question. Where in the resolutions is he resolving himself to rest in Christ? Like, I'm resolving to set aside all earthly desires. I'm setting any temptation to put trust in my flesh or any temptation to put trust in faithfulness. Then I'd be all about those resolutions. Like, give me 70 resolutions where every day I'm 
trying to resolve to only rest in Christ, but it's not. It's he's resolving towards performance. And some of those, I would say Jonathan Edwards, his intentions are not evil. It's not like he's trying to uh, teach some bad theology. I think his resolve was to glorify God. So um, kudos to that. But it's coming from a distortion of justification and sanctification. So in this, the, the, you're resolving to do something because you think the end result will, will, will uh, present you more righteous before God. And it's, um, we're going to see here, and it's, it's not the case. Moving quickly through this so we can get through all these notes. Uh, you guys got, uh, we go from Jonathan Edwards to men like John and Charles Wesley. So these two brothers um, really have kind of a, a big evangelical shift from a faith-driven sanctification to a works um, sanctification. These men emphasize personal holiness by means of methods. Of course, they started the Methodist, Methodist movement. Methodist professor and writer Randy Maddox wrote this in Christianity Today, which I found fascinating about John Wesley. He said he championed pursuit of holiness through spiritual disciplines, typically describing the Christian's goal as perfect love. Seamlessly, he issued denials of any perfect holiness in his life. So you have uh, Jonathan, uh, John and Charles Wesley, very popular, very famous, a lot of their, a lot of uh, influence, especially in the Methodist movement. But they are really the one who, uh, kind of on the heels of Jonathan Edwards, popularized, begin to popularize this concept of disciplining yourself or making sure that you are doing certain things that make you holy before God. Now, I would not describe Wesley's view of spiritual formation as the same as Foster and Willard. Uh, I don't think Foster and Willard go as far as Wesley did, but he did uh, start a trend confusing the emphasis of personal holiness and Rich kind of ended up leading people to think that they could live perfect lives or get into perfectionism. And then this leads to the 19th century. You have big influencer like Charles Finney, and you see the, the rise of of revivalism in America. If you haven't heard uh, Byron's series on From Here to There, spends a lot of time in revivalism. I encourage you to go and listen to that series. It's free for those of you that are Total Access members. But Charles Finney has been described as the father of modern revivalism. And uh, I mention Finney here because of his strong influence away from historic biblical theology. In his systematic theology, Finney asks this question, does a Christian cease to be a Christian whenever he commits a sin, right? It's a great question in his systematic theology. Here's his answer. Whenever he sins, he must, for the time being, cease to be holy. The Christian, therefore, is justified no longer than he obeys and must be condemned when he disobeys. Or antinomianism is true. In these respects, then, the sinning Christian and the unconverted sinner are upon precisely the same ground that that that's an ouch <laughs> to theology he's saying the moment you sin you are no longer justified and this man has a heavy influence on a lot of american theology a lot of re the revivalistic movement is fear tactic driven and so you have people questioning their salvation and it's very heavy performance based so you must perform well and of course, a lot of people would deny this theology, but the influence of Finney can very much be seen in today's teaching. Two of uh, the most well-known other men that kind of followed on the heels of Finney, which is D.L. Moody and Billy Sunday, and they too would attempt to change America's, what there was his lack of godliness through moralistic preaching. By this time in American history, the Reformed theology was really on a decline and moral-driven moral sermons was very much on an uh, on an incline. <coughs> Excuse me. So this was kind of like I would say I was really brief, kind of quick through. Ryan, do we have any questions yet? Yeah, John Decker asked. So the Puritans added prayer before meals. I have a question: Is that where that came from? Yeah, uh, they required it. They made it as as a requirement. So there's nothing in Scripture. Look. I think it's good to pray for emails. It's good to stop at any moment and thank God for anything. But to require it would mean if you didn't do it, you're in sin, right? So some people, when they don't eat, like uh, when they don't pray before they eat, they feel guilty like they did something wrong. 
that's that was the dangerous is it was they made it a part of kind of like within the church culture it was a requirement to do that so to answer and their question Lynchin asked uh, did the puritans not hold to the confessions also wasn't private devotion devotionals a moravian concept even before the puritan yeah it was definitely a moravian concept i think that the it within the reform crowd it did begin to uh, the puritans it began to influence them what was that? What was the other question? Did the Puritans hold to the confession? Yeah, yes, they did. Um, but you would, like I said, you would see it seep in. And uh, it wasn't very prevalent during the You can see, like when I was doing my research, there was, you can see where it began to seep in. And even with, uh, to be clear, every confessional church doesn't mean that their theology is sound and perfect and they're not going to struggle with legalism. As a matter of fact, there are confessional churches that hold a spiritual disciplines, which is kind of confusing to me. So just to be clear, just because you're confessional doesn't mean your theology is going to be absolutely sound because it depends on how well do you hold to the confessions. So hopefully that answered those questions. So the further we move away from the, Re the Reformation, the closer we are returning to the Roman Catholic theology concerning spiritual growth and piety. That's kind of the train of thought I wanted you to see. And that gets us to the 1970s. So we do not see spiritual disciplines truly gain traction in American culture until at this point. So it's here and there, it's in pockets, it's beginning to gain traction through guys like Charles Finney and Dale Moody, uh, through revivalism, but the explosion where it becomes common knowledge, like everywhere, everyone's accepting the concept really doesn't take traction until the 1970s so who modern influence of spiritual disciplines uh, the modern influencers are the three we're going to look at is richard foster dallas willard and don whitney so let's start with richard foster uh, foster is a quaker writer and theologian wrote a book in 1978 entitled Celebration of Discipline, which really is what caused the explosion. And probably by far the most uh, influential individual to give rise to this. Um, and, uh, and many have uh, um, many have titled Richard Foster to be kind of the father of the modern spiritual disciplines movement. So Foster himself writes, today it is rare, it is a rare person who has not heard the term spiritual disciplines. Seminary courses in spiritual formation proliferate like baby rabbits, and it is absolutely true. Even in so-called so reformed schools, there are classes on reform, uh, sorry, on spiritual disciplines. Um, uh, a good example of this would be Southern Seminary. So what is complicated about many of the things, uh, many of these men's works is that they will sound so close to what scripture says. So that's, that's what can be complicated is that, wow, what, what they sound, it sounds true. For instance, in his book, uh, will, uh, Foster states, inner righteousness is a gift from God to be graciously received. The needed change within us is God's work, not ours. I couldn't agree more. I mean, that is an absolute brilliant statement, but he goes on to abandon that very statement in his work later on. For, for instance, <clears throat> he confuses the two. In the quote, he says, God has given us the disciplines of the spiritual life as a means of receiving his grace. As a means of receiving his grace. So we have to discipline in order to do that. The disciplines allow us to place ourselves before God so that he can transform us. So again, it's not faith that transforms us. It's discipline that transforms us. So he's beginning to deny the very statement he had quoted before. So in this book, Foster provides an extensive list of various disciplines that help us uh, help us assess our transformation, assist us in our transformation. So some of the ones that he gives is simplicity, solitude, submission, and service to name a few. The problem with this list is that scripture never states that any of these actions actually produce spiritual transformation so simplicity solitude and submission unless you're submitting yourself to the lord jesus christ in faith uh they don't produce in us transformation scripture never equates that but according to foster he's going to argue for that do we have any other new questions what is the role of spiritual disciplines all right we'll get to that 
at the end. So that's a great question. So hold on to that. Yeah, John bon, John Dunbar asks, "What do you think the reason for the rise of Pietism is due to the due to the perceived lack of values in society during the time of Moody and Sunday?" All right. So yeah, I'm going to read this for uh, for those for the recording later. Do you think that? So this is from John Bum John Dunbar. Do you think that the reason for the rise of Pietism is due to the perceived lack of morals values in society during the time of Moody? Yes. So uh, the moral laxity is we would say is that they were afraid that the uh, Christianity was in decline. Abuse of alcohol is a big issue. Men out of work, getting drunk, laying in the in laying in the street. So you have this high uh, move against alcoholism, and and what they're going to do is transform the culture, and they do it through Pietism, where they do it through fear and through guilt. So absolutely. So instead of trusting in the power of the Spirit and preaching of the gospel. They then bring moralism. And this is why even Finney goes as far to say that if you're in sin, you're just like the unbeliever. So if you die in sin without repenting, you're just like the unbeliever. So it's a great question. All right. So Foster's example. So uh, understanding that he, he would say, yes, transformation happens by the work of the Spirit. But yet these are the list of things that we must do is a good example of a hybrid of mixing biblical teaching with mystic and Jesuit practices. And of course, he's a Quaker writer, so it, uh, Quakerism is, is affecting him as well. As you read Foster's writing, you will observe that he clearly is versed in the writings of Catholic and Jesuit orders and makes references to them often in his book. So uh, I don't want to make this claim without actually showing it to you. Here are several people, several uh, Roman Catholic writers who have influenced Foster and again, remember, Foster, father of modern view of spiritual disciplines, his book causes the explosion. These are the men that he's recommending and also the men that are influencing him. So first, uh, which we mentioned, the Counter-Reformation, right? Remember, Ignatius of Loyola. In his book, there is a section that covers forms of meditation. So Foster's book, there's a section that says forms of meditation. And Foster writes, seek to live the experience remembering the encounter of Ignatius of Loyola to apply all our senses to our task. Okay, so Foster introducing two believers, a man who was fighting against the Counter-Reformation, sorry, against the Reformation, trying to reinstate justification by works and sanctification by works, right? So if you have no idea who Ignatius is and you're reading Foster's book, you have no concept of uh, church history and you're reading Foster's book, you're like, wow, yeah, we're going to, we're going to, this man's old and he's, he's been a part of the church for a long time. So the statement seems harmless. And for years, Christians kind of just embrace Foster's writing because they don't know who Ignatius is. But again, remind you, Ignatius is writing against Luther and Calvin. Another example of this is uh, Thomas Merton in the middle of the 20th century. Thomas Merton was a, uh, um, um was a man famously known as a Trappist monk who lived in Gethsemane, Kentucky, which isn't too far from here. And he wrote a lot. He wrote over 70 books on the subject of spirituality. And one of Merton's best loved books was actually his autobiography, which is called The Seven Story Mountain, which was written about 1948. And Foster, in an attempt to encourage the Roman Catholic concept of meditation, so in his section on meditation, points his readers to Merton's writings. And this is what he says. Thomas Merton writes that the person who has meditated on the passion of Christ but has not meditated on the uh, extermination camps of Dachau and Auschwitz has not fully entered into the experience of Christianity in our time. Which is, so again, Foster is saying if you want to be transformed in the image of Christ, you want to be sanctified, he is encouraging the writings of Roman Catholic theology, specifically in the areas of meditating. And in our meditation, you can't just meditate on Scripture. It has to be things like extermination camps. So, again, just, just confusion as it relates to our understanding of Scripture. Someone asked me earlier in before we got started on Henry Nouwen, and I think this uh, um, Foster uses Nouwen quite a bit. And in quoting Nouwen, he says, God... The God who dwells in our inner sanctuary is the same as the one who dwells in the inner sanctuary of each human being. So you have here 
Foster encouraging his readers to partake in now in theology of meditation. And in opening this book, as he's doing so, there's almost this universalism. Like everybody has God. Everybody has God that resides in them. He's using now in theology as a form of meditation. In, his, in, in the book, he says, Without solitude, it is virtually impossible to lead a spiritual life. Why is this so? Because in solitude, we are freed from our bondage to people and our inner compulsion, and we are free to love God and know compassion for others. Well, that is an interesting statement. He's saying it's impossible to lead a spiritual life unless we find ourselves in solitude. What does this sound like? Well, monasteries, right? Catholic monasteries. So he's saying that spiritual progression, spiritual growth, absolutely cannot happen unless we're in solitude. So Foster's positively introduced three popular Catholic teachers, mystic writers, two of them from the 20th century, as experts in the area of spiritual growth. So the explosion of spiritual disciplines, which is uh, attributed to Richard Foster, he's using openly Catholic theologians who are not leading us to understanding of faith uh, our sanctification by faith alone, even our justification is by faith alone, but is putting it next to really mysticism and asceticism, which, of course, Colossians says asceticism is not how we deal with the flesh. Um, so i got to skip some time here. We're running out of time, so let me move this forward. Uh, I, I do want to point out that he never really, Foster really never points out in a footnote that this that these men have Roman Catholic backgrounds. He kind of just places them on the level of authority. So if you, if you can uh, take all those quotes and check them in the book. Now, I think there's an interesting quote here by J.I. Packer, and it's um, in relation to um, Foster's book. J.I. Packer writes, conservatives, conservative evangelicals have noticed Foster's influence on Christian thinking, unfortunately have embraced it, I'm sorry, no, here's the quote. I apologize. Ever since Richard Foster rang the bell with his celebration of discipline in 1978, discussing the various spiritual disciplines has become a staple element of conservative Christian in talk in Northern America. This is a happy thing. So here we begin to see you have people who consider themselves to be reformed writers promoting Foster's work. So confusion all around. And the confusion is going to get even greater with guys like Dallas Willard. So let's go with Dallas Willard and Don Winnie. Now, this is where this is where we're going to spend the, the rest of our time. Do we have any questions I need to answer? Okay. All right. Dallas Willard is the second author teacher who has had a large influence in popularizing the spiritual disciplines movement. And he was also a strong influence both in Foster and Whitney. So Willard was actually writing on spiritual disciplines before Foster was, but he wasn't really gaining any traction. Willard influenced Foster, and Foster exploded. But this is some of the uh, theology behind Richard Foster. Sorry, uh, Dallas Willard. Dallas Willard writes, here's the quote, I want to explain with some precision and detail fullness how activities such as solitude, silence, fasting, prayer, service, celebration, Discipline for life in the spiritual kingdom of God and activities in which Jesus deeply immersed himself are essential to the deliverance of human beings from the concrete power of sin and how they can make the experience of the easy yoke a reality in life. By focusing on the whole of Christ's life, note, not his finished work, and the lives of many who have best succeeded in following him, I will outline psychologically and theologically sound, testable way to meet grace and fully conform to him. So Willard's list of activities, solitude, silence, among others, are never, as I mentioned, described in Scripture. But he is saying that these are the best ways to succeed in following Christ or being transformed into the image of Christ. So Willard has placed the reader's faith in their faithfulness is what he's saying. Their ability to complete these actions, which ultimately points away from Christ. He goes on to say uh, on his website, so clarifying this, he's, got, he's gotten some questions on, well, what do you mean by this? Can you please clarify? And this is what he says. Sometimes we think of spiritual formation as formation by the Holy Spirit. Once again, this is essential. But now I have to say something that may be challenging for you to think about. Spiritual formation is not... At, not at all by the Holy Spirit. We have 
we have to recognize that spiritual formation in, in, in us is something that is done to us by those around us, by ourselves, and by activities which we will voluntarily untake. This has to be the method. Again, this can be confusing. I think a lot of what he's saying is true, but he's combining them. For instance, I think that when I go and participate in the means of grace, I am with my fellow believers. We are receiving Christ together. The fellowship that we're building another one are up into love and uh, love into good works, right? So I, I believe in all of that. That's good. But when he's talking about there's aspects of what we must do that actually transform us into the image of Christ. And unless you do this, this has to be done this way. He's now taking what I would say the means of grace and he's adding more to it. Uh, real quickly, and this is probably the one that most of you have probably heard of, which is Don Whitney. And sadly, in recent history, the Reformed and what is known as Calvinistic crowd, I would say, have embraced this uh, concept of spiritual disciplines within the Reformed theology. Uh, the most well-known and accepted book by many conservative and Reformed Christians today is Don Whitney's book, Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life. I'd be curious how many people have that book. Uh, maybe leave a comment. <clears throat> the influence of both Foster and Willard's writing are very evident in Whitney's theology. In his first book, he has some quotes in there, which are references to the Roman Catholic writings. He received strong criticisms of that. So when he did the updated version, he took a lot of those references out and left mostly just Christian writings. But early in his book, around page 16 or 17, he writes, I will maintain the only road to Christian maturity and godliness passes through the practice of spiritual disciplines. Okay? What does he mean by that? Okay, let's not criticize him too quickly. If he's saying we must discipline ourselves as far as like focusing on our faith and not our faithfulness, I agree with him. But Whitney begins to explain what does he mean by this. So, Again, I maintain that our only road to Christian maturity and godliness passes through the practice of spiritual disciplines. This book examines the spiritual disciplines of Bible intake, prayer, worship, evangelism, service, stewardship, fasting, silence, and solitude, journaling, and learning. This is by no means, however, an exhausted list of spiritual, dis uh, spiritual disciplines of Christian living. A survey of other literature on the subject would reveal that confession, accountability, simplicity, submission, spiritual direction, celebration, affirmation, sacrifice, watching. Watching what? Wouldn't it be great if watching Netflix was a spiritual discipline? Mm. <laughs> and more also qualify as spiritual disciplines. Right. I thought it was. <laughs> yeah, for some. <laughs> for some. Um so it's like anything could be, this is going back to D.A. Carson's point, anything at this point can be a spiritual discipline, and you can turn it into a means by which we are more godly. Uh, so again, confusing. So it's, it would be easy to find many of the disciplines Whitney provided in the Bible. You can find some, right? I don't disagree with some of these, which is praying, right? There's nothing wrong, or fasting. These are not necessarily wrong uh, part things to participate in in Christian. What he's saying is, I maintain the only road to Christian maturity is through these means. So if you're not doing this, you cannot become a uh, mature Christian. In other words, you cannot be sanctified. That's important to observe about Whitney's list is that he explains there are more than just the list he provides. And again, he begins to add in some of the, the writings from, I would say, Foster and even Ignatius uh, as far as solitude and quiet. Uh, but she goes, you know, so just to point out some of the connections there, you can see the influence there. Uh, but in his uh, in, in his book, later on, he urges Christians towards spiritual disciplines. When he, This is what he writes. You can read the quote that's in here. And so the urgent question every Christian should ask is, how then shall I pursue holiness, the holiness without which I will see the Lord? How can I become more like Jesus Christ? We find a clear answer in 1 Timothy 4, 7. Discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. In other words, if your purpose is godliness and godliness is your purpose, if you have are the indwell of, by the Holy Spirit, for he makes godliness your purpose, then how do you pursue that purpose? According to this verse, you discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. Now, I believe that Whitney would reject any notion of good works are the basis for our salvation. There's no way that he would hold that. If you pressed him, he would say, no, it's only if you have my faith alone. But in this quote, what he's doing is he is he's taking spiritual disciplines to its logical conclusion. 
Without holiness, you will not see God. And then he quotes 1 Timothy. Discipline yourself for the sake of godliness. So he's saying, if you do not discipline yourself and become godly, you won't see God. You see the circle there? That's the danger. That's exactly what Ignatius was saying. And that's even what Charles Finney is saying, that if you're not willing to become almost perfect and discipline yourself toward this direction, then you're playing with your justification. Again, I am not accusing Whitney of being a heretic. I'm just saying when you combine Roman Catholic teaching in with the Bible, when it comes to spiritual disciplines, you're going to, you're going to end up making conclusions that contradict each other. And I think this is a good example of that. Um, one, one I added in recently, this is a book by David Mathis. Um, and I will, I will get through this real quick and then I will take your guys questions. And I think, yeah, we got enough time. We are doing great on time. So David Mathis uh, would be the most recent, I think, popular book. It, it really kind of hit the market pretty well. I think it was sent out to a lot of churches. And for those of you that don't know, he's the direct, uh, executive director for Desiring God Ministries. And his book is entitled Habits of Grace, Enjoying Jesus Through Spiritual Disciplines. And what's hard about this book is that it's been endorsed by some pretty big names, right? John Piper, Don Whitney, Tim Challies, Jerry Bridges, which I came up earlier, and even D.A. Carson. And I believe uh, I believe that some of these men that have endorsed this book because it it's kind of portraying a, what I would say a, a reformed view because uh, because some of the language that it's using. So, for instance, Mathis in his book he uses the word means of grace as the baseline reasoning for the spiritual disciplines. And here's the confusion. So he says means of grace. But he actually never talks about the means of grace from a reform confessional perspective. He actually promotes spiritual disciplines. So he's, I think he's trying to create a hybrid of like, let's bring the reform guides in and the spiritual disciplines together. But the 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 reason I struggle with the book is that he kind of just tells you he's taking Whitney's work and he's just kind of condensing it down. So there's a paragraph in the opening of the book. In the purpose of his book, he says, in particular, I'm eager to help Christians, young and old, simplify their approach to their various personal habits of grace or spiritual disciplines by highlighting the three key principles of ongoing grace, hearing God's voice, his word, having his ear, prayer, and belonging to his body fellowship. And then he later on admits that whatever the terms, the key is that God has revealed certain channels through his, which he regularly pours out his favor. And we are foolish not to take his word on them and build habits of spiritual life around them. All right. So I don't agree with, I don't disagree with everything that he's saying, except for the concept behind it. And this is the, the, the major issue I'm having with all of these guys. So Willard Foster, uh, Whitney, and, and even Mathis is that they believe the way in which we are transformed in the image of God is through faithfulness to these particular lists. Mathis gives the smallest. He gives three. Um, Foster gives the most. But again, the question is, who's right? So this is where I think clarifying, are we saved and sanctified by faith alone, or are we saved by faith and then we are sanctified by spiritual disciplines? That, that particular question to be answered. I would say the easiest way to clarify this is if an emphasis on the personal interior of the Christian life is the way in which you believe that you are becoming more holy, so how you are performing different acts, then you have confused what means of grace is, what the means of grace, uh, how we are to participate in the means of grace. Uh, I'm not going to get into this unless it comes up in a question. This is my next lecture, which is in lecture three. Uh, we will spend a lot of time in this, but I'll set it up for you. If you look at the Christian life and how it is that we are transformed from one image into another, that life, I'm sorry, from one, from, if we're transformed from, into the image of Christ, that happens in a corporate global level. Not entirely, but the, but the economy of Christianity is seen in that way. For instance, when Paul or any of the New Testament writers are writing to the church, they're writing to individuals but that individual application is applied always in a corporate context. So when you have the preaching of God's word as one of the means, that's a corporate setting. You have, 
you have men who are training God's word, who have been approved by the congregation and the elders who are to stand up and exhort people to put their faith in Christ. And that is one of the means that God has instituted as the way in which you will be transformed into his image. You are putting faith in Christ in the means of a corporate preaching. And then even in the receiving of the elements, so the Lord's table. Again, it's something that's being done to you in a corporate reality. Um, and then even baptism, which is seen as a corporate reality. The only part that you have that's individualized in a private moment is really prayer. And if you think about prayer, if prayer is dependence, then you are depending upon God for everything that's there. You are not doing it as a dependent upon self. In other words, you will be less godly if you don't spend a certain amount of time in prayer. You are now putting your faith in your faithfulness, right? So even your prayer is now, you're misplacing your prayer. Prayer is designed to make sure that you stay in dependence upon God for his righteousness. Okay, I'm going to end there because we're exactly at 8.30. I'm going to go ahead and grab your guys' questions. Okay. You want me to start from the top? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, what, just tell me what the first one is. Lynn. But, Lynn. Yeah. Lynn. Right, uh, right under the movie. The John, Bunba, John Dunbar. Lynn has two. Karen. Oh, wow. There's a... On live chat. Uh, I guess. Well, there's a read. Read to me the first question. And I'll I'll see if I can find it. Uh, what then is the role of spiritual disciplines, if any? Okay, here we go. There we go. Yes. Um, role of spiritual disciplines. Um, I don't really think there is a role for them because I think the theology behind them is um, skewed. It's wrong. The the Bible. To be clear, this is where the confusion happens. What people hear me say then is, oh, then I guess Christians don't need to be disciplined. I'm not saying that. As a matter of fact, Paul says the exact opposite. What do you say? I beat my body, right? I beat down because what does our flesh wants to do? Our flesh wants to flourish. We want to go do things that are sinful. But Paul also says in Colossians that if you use means of the flesh to fight sin, it doesn't work, right? So this is the end of Colossians chapter three, two and three. So I think that if you're going to discipline yourself, I think you need to discipline yourself in trusting in the finished work of Christ or focusing your attention on Christ. And from your faith in Christ, you then obey, you then, you then move out. Um, the danger of spiritual disciplines, as I said before, is that you're always focusing in on you and you personally. So you, you don't see your need to depend upon the body and upon the preaching of the body of the preaching of God's word and the fellowship of the people you depend upon i have to do accomplish these things myself so solitude meditation journaling which journaling uh, multiple people have kept journaling as a spiritual discipline i'm just like i don't see that in scripture as a command from god to do this and therefore you shall become more like christ but i don't think there's anything wrong with journaling if you want to write out your prayers or even just document what God is doing or your heart in life. There's nothing wrong with it. But if you think that doing that somehow is, is um, going to make you further along in your sanctification, you've just mistaken that, that that's not how it works. So I, I, I have a struggle with the list of things that are given. If you think doing that equates spiritual growth, um, then here's your list. Um, preaching of God's word, the Lord's table and baptism are the means by which God has given us to grow. So, great question. Let me keep moving through these. What are your thoughts on A.W. Pink's holiness? What are my thoughts on A.W. Pink's holiness? Um, I haven't read that in years, so I really can't answer that. So, um, maybe on a podcast or another time, I'll, I'll take a look at that. I'll make sure John answers these. Okay. Um, Thomas Merton sounds like a modern day. Yeah. Uh, so are these examples of moralizing the gospel? Jesus went off by himself to pray. I think so. Um, now, Jesus does say when you go alone to pray, right? So he is assuming we're going to pray alone. But there's never a, we, we like to say, well, Jesus went and prayed early in the morning. And Jesus went and prayed late at night. So we, if, if Jesus, who is sinless, needs to do that, then we need to do that as well. Uh, you have to be careful in that. That's not necessarily the truth. Um, there is the, like fasting, there is the concept that we do fast and we do pray, but putting 
a requirement on it. Uh, I, I just think you're going outside of scripture at that moment and you're forgetting what the point of prayer is. Point of prayer is dependence. So it's our need to, to, to rely on God for everything in life. So, so how do you interpret scriptures like first John, whoever says that he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. I get tripped up on this. Uh, I love how he says, I get tripped up on this when he's talking about walking. Well done. Yes, I don't. Yeah, nice pun. I, I, I do not. We always um, like to separate. It's either spiritual disciplines always is obedience. And if you live by faith, there is no obedience. Please understand. When James says, if you have faith and not work, your faith is dead. I agree with James. There's no, in the Reformed faith, we are not saying that it is faith alone. We are saved by faith alone, and we are sanctified by faith alone. Therefore, there is no works. You just have to understand what the purpose of works are and where they come. In pietism and in even in Catholic theology, the emphasis is on works, right? My works either save me or my works are confirming my salvation, or in some ways, my works are holding up my salvation, right? So what we love, I would say the, the most popular version of it is my works hold up my salvation. So I put a lot of uh, a lot of hope in my works, and that makes spiritual disciplines make sense, right? So if I'm disciplining myself in my Bible reading, and I'm disciplining myself in my prayer life, or whatever else you want to put in there, then I'm proving that I'm, I'm actually a believer. Well, what, what's hard in then is in First John, John actually is not talking about individualizing obedience. He's, he's, he's talking about people who are unwilling to love the body. John flat out says, if you say you love me and have not love for your brother, you're a liar. Because those who have been transformed by the Holy Spirit and brought into the family of God, they are now see themselves as part of this family and dependent upon this family. And if you reject that and say, no, I hate those people, and I and you are unwilling to see them and love them, he's saying, then you don't understand the gospel. So he's he's not saying your love is required as far as um, it is the natural next step. He's saying that's just what happens. Uh, you have been transformed by the Spirit. This is what ends up happening. A good example of this is in John 10. I just got done teaching John 10. And in John 10... They say to Jesus, will you please just make it plain? Will you just please make it plain? Do you, or are you the Christ? And Jesus says, look, for the last 10 chapters, of course, he doesn't say this, but for the last 10 chapters, I've illustrated through what I've said and what I've done that I am him. Because you don't believe because you are not my sheep. But then you have people in the very next verse who say, man, we believe. Well, what's the difference? You have people who believe and put their faith in Jesus and then follow him because of the powers, the spirit of the power that's in them. I, sometimes we are trying to beat people into salvation. If they don't see the need for obedience, it's not that they need to obey. It's that they don't understand the gospel. So that's the difference. It's just kind of clarifying that. So we're going to go and move on to the next one. Okay, only that's three. Um, what is the outward? The question, WLC's question, is what are the outward means? The answer is the, ordin the outward and ordinary, especially the word sacraments and prayer. And this question is third one down. Would this not mean reading the word and prayer or spiritual disciplines that are effective for the elect for sanctification by the Spirit, using these as means? So, would the Spirit use uh, the word and prayer as yeah. for sanctifying effect? Yeah, so uh, to clarify, I guess to, to sum it up, it, does the Spirit use prayer and Bible reading as means to grow us spiritually? Yes, I believe that the Spirit can do that. But Here's the danger. When you place requirements on Christians and saying one, a one-to-one -one correlation, right? Your Bible reading is equally is, uh, connected to your spiritual growth. Here's the danger in that. I know people who know their Bible way more than I do, and they're not believers. I mean, they know it in Greek and Hebrew. They can, they can exegete a passage far better than I can, but they don't have faith in Christ alone. So you have to be careful in making the one-to-one -one correlations because they, it doesn't necessarily work that way. There are other people who know their Bible really well, and they live in complete sin. So they might be a believer, but man, they have, they have, well, they have been well-trained, but they're, they're living in sin. And are they a believer? I don't know. We have been so programmed to think that what I do personally is what transforms me personally. 
Okay, again, it's interior of the Christian life. What the means of grace point to us is that everything is outside of us and it's designed by God. What's interesting is if you try and find in scripture where there's a one-to-one -one correlation to the personal time in the word, okay, where you are reading on a daily basis and that reading is telling you that it's gonna, it is gonna result in a transformation of the spirit. Is you're gonna hard press to find that because it did the Bibles didn't exist during Jesus's time during the Old Testament. A lot of what was uh, brought put down was verbal, and then it was the reading of God's word. So they would go and they would hear and they would hear God's word read and they would try and put it into their hearts so they could remember it. But there was not this daily moment where they would sit down and they would say, Okay, I'm gonna read God's word, and as I read his word, that reading. The act of reading will then transform my heart or transform me or sanctify me into the image of Christ. That's a dangerous concept to have because here's why. You're putting your faith in the action of reading instead of in the person of Christ. Now, I, I, you have to be careful in that because you might – I understand if you're reading Scripture and the result of script, your Scripture reading is leading you to faith in Christ, that's fine. I will say, though, in Scripture, you have the exhortation to the preaching of God's word and the table and baptism. And in that corporate reality, you are considering how to build one another up into love and the good works. Right. So those are the clear commands in Scripture. If do I read my Bible? Yes, I love to read the word of God. It's very encouraging. I do not equate the amount of time I read in the word of God to my spiritual growth. That is the danger. Okay, that, that's all I'm trying to say is that you cannot make a one-to-one -one correlation. The more time I spend in God's word, does it reveal more truth to me? Absolutely, but it's not the guarantee that that action is going to cause greater faith in Christ. I know the preaching of the word, I know the table will, and so that's what I trust in. Okay. Um, Phil, uh, Phil Carpenter, what's up, Phil? <laughs> asks about 1 Timothy 4 7. Okay. Um, I don't know, I'm off the top of my head. What time? I just want to make sure we got. Oh, we got plenty of time. First Timothy four seven. Uh, we got about uh, about fifteen minutes. Okay, so First Timothy. Yeah. So it says, having nothing to do with irrelevant silly myths, rather train yourself for godliness. That's a great question. Okay, so, um, uh, man, I'd have to look at that within this context, but I think what he's talking about here, um, if you put these things, my brothers, you will be good servants of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and the good doctrine. Yeah, having nothing to do with irreverent silly myths. Rather train yourself for godless for a while. Bodily training is, godliness is a true value and it holds promise. Yeah, okay. Um, I don't have a problem with this, first of all, because it's uh, scripture, right? <laughs> it's Paul writing. Again, we think that that training is uh, equating to your standing. So that that's the confusion here. So if you think the godliness, that the training for yourself for godliness is equating towards um, your standing before God, that's the confusion. There, there are people within my congregation that I have to help form and shape. What does it look like to pursue and love one another and to good, love a good work? So we've been highly individualized. So what, what Timothy is saying is that, look, it's going to take work in order to learn how to love your neighbor, right? It, 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 a lot of this doesn't necessarily come naturally. So is I said this in the beginning of the lecture, Christian, I don't, I don't believe that Christians are lazy. And they shouldn't have discipline. So when it says discipline yourself for the sake of godliness, I don't have a problem with that because our bodies naturally want to sin. The, the danger of it is if you think that the disciplining is the result of, right? This is why in Theocast do this all the time, done before do. So in, in, in 1 Timothy, you have Paul who is laying gospel truth down on the believer. And from that gospel truth now comes the what we call boots on the ground, the application of that. So saying, if it's true, if Christ is your redeemer, if Christ has bought and paid for you and you've been transformed into his image, you now have a mission, right? That, that mission now is to take what's vertical and make it horizontal. 
because most of the commands, almost all the commands besides glorifying God are vertical. I'm sorry, they're, they're, they're um, horizontal, meaning that it's for the benefit of the believer. So, yeah, I don't have a problem at all for someone who dedicates their time, disciplines their body, making sure that they are uh, loving the body in, in, in that way. I, that, I don't think that negates living a life by faith, right? So those who live by faith are not lazy. Uh, no one ever could call Paul lazy, but it's where you rest. And I have an illustration. I'll close the, I'll close, uh, the evening with that illustration. Let me just grab some of these other questions. There any pushback again? against Puritan pure, Puritan pietism, Cotton Mather, for example, in their time? Um, that's a good question. Um, I don't know. I didn't get that far in my research, but that, that is actually a great question. It'd be interesting to, to research that. Yeah, Metro Word, you mentioned prayer as individual dependence. How do you think of taking in God's Word regularly alone, either by reading or meditation, sanctified by truth, trusting in the gospel to sanctify it? I, I don't think I don't think it's wrong or sinful. Okay, so the I think I've said this before. <laughs> so the receiving of God's word personally, there's nothing wrong with it. The danger is thinking that that it's a priority above the actual means that are given to us. Okay, uh, going on long walks alone can be beneficial. Um, refraining from certain things can be beneficial. But again, remember your faith is in Christ to sanctify us and by the means that's been given to us. So we're washed with the word. I think that's why it's important that when we go here preaching, that we want to be washed with the word as far as in hearing of Christ to, again, once have our faith renewed in Christ, not have our motivation renewed for faithfulness. Most of the time you go in here preaching, it's motivational speaking. Here are five ways to be more faithful this week, and now you've been re-energized to do that. Instead of being washed by the word of, here is how we can rest in the finished work of Christ. And from this resting position, we now will go out and love our brothers, right? So there's, there's a difference in that. When it comes to Bible reading, I don't, if someone wants to discipline themselves to read the Bible, that's fine. But if you make a one-to-one -one correlation, my discipline in my Bible reading equals my righteousness, that's the danger. But if you say, listen, I enjoy the truth of Christ and I enjoy reveling in the truth of Christ on a daily basis because I can, I don't have a problem with that. But the danger, again, is the more I discipline myself in my Bible reading, the more I'll be like Christ. It is by faith that we're that way. So it's just don't put your faith in the actions of Bible reading. Like I'll make a, I'll make a wild, crazy statement here. There are people who live a life of faith, enjoying the wonders of Christ, um, are very effective within the community and the body for hundreds of years and could not read and could not read. Like that's like history. There were cultures for more, more, this is what caused a lot of the dark ages, even with the Roman Catholic theology that they, they, they had the, the center on education. You, are you telling me that unless someone can read every single day that they won't truly have a, a full experience within Christ um, I think it's why it's important when Paul instructs Timothy and the and the elders to make sure that the teachers are not novice. You want men up there who can uh, lead people into faith in Christ and lead them well. So uh, again, there's just there's this heavy emphasis on individualizing, and what I'm saying is the Bible leads us into a corporate reality. Our sanctification is connected corporately. I'm going to just read you this real quick. This is getting into my uh, my next lecture, but uh, I'll. I'll I'll just encourage you to read Ephesians 3 and 4. And in Ephesians 3 and 4, Paul lays out this whole instruction to the body. And he says, if the body functions properly, it builds itself up in love. What's interesting about that is he's taking individual people and he's saying the corporate reality is how you grow. Nowhere in Scripture do you have someone who correlates one-to-one -one growth as far as growing up in Christ as it relates to personal action in quietness or in their Bibles alone. So search scripture and find that. There is definitely internalizing of it, but the, the, the application of it is always corporate. Okay, let me grab some of these other questions. Okay, Michael Murray asks, uh, why would you agree that our relationship with these activities, Bible reading, prayer, et cetera, has changed from a requirement to grow to more of an opportunity to do these things because of faith in Christ? 
motivation? Yeah. So um, if you're if you've been kind of walking down this road uh, with Theocast or just in a Reformed theology, you go from a requirement to something we get to do. Uh, I would say absolutely. Um, uh, I, th I think it terrifies people that I don't stress Bible reading. And there's a side in every single every single person. It's like, no, 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 John, you really need to encourage people to be in their Bibles every single day. And I, there, just to be frank, if I do that, if I make that pressure on people that they are not a good Christian and they don't grow unless they have this, uh, I am setting myself kind of outside of one, I think scripture, but also outside of the, of history. It's just, it's just not a hundred years ago. It wasn't, it wasn't, you were it was, you had family Bibles maybe, but 200 years ago, no one had Bibles that was that easy to have. So you couldn't practice in this way. It was, it was harder to do this kind of a practice. So how do you love and encourage someone? Well, you have to be together and you would encourage each other through the words surrounding it through the times of teaching uh, with prayer. Again, I encourage you to, I keep saying this, read chapter five, and I'm going to do some more teaching on prayer. But if you understand prayer to be a dependence, I pray because I must depend upon God. I don't pray because somehow uh, the more I pray, it equals to my transformation in the spirit. Uh, I always am transformed by faith. Um, that's the danger. So, But to actually answer Michael Michael's question, I would say, for those of us who live by faith, done before do, the time in the Word is a sweet time. It's a time to be reflective and refreshed, but we don't feel like it's a necessary in order. If I don't do this, then I'm a bad Christian. If I don't do this, I'm going to fall prey to sin. Um, I don't think that if, if, if there's a man who's traveling and he's got all these cells uh, things and he can't get 30 minutes in the Word, that he's now in danger of falling into sin. Um I don't see that because then that means there have been men and women who have been in danger to fall in sin for, for thousands of years because they haven't had their own personal Bible. It's faith in Christ and the finished work of Christ resting in Christ and in these truths that keep us. So what do we, if we walk by the spirit, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walking by the spirit is not daily time in the word. Walking by the spirit is living in a reality that Christ's righteousness is what clothes me. And God sees me as holy and righteous, and I trust in that. And when temptation comes and says, but you can trust in this, I can push against that and say, no, I'm trusting in Christ's righteousness. I don't need that flesh to come and get me. And then when I do fall into it, what does he say? Go back and read your Bibles. Go back and do more. He says, no, repent of that sin. And this is part of that disciplining yourself for the sake of godliness. You need it, to repent of sin takes discipline, right? But why am I disciplining myself? It's out of love. I am not trying to reposition myself righteous before God because I need uh, that required righteousness. I'm doing it out of love for what he's done for me. So good, good question. All right, let me grab a couple more of these and we'll be done. Um, Len has the last four. Okay. But reading the word of prayer is, is a means of sanctification. I don't think of a one-to-one -one correlation. But that it's a... Uh, but that, you know, it, it, it's, it's a means through which God yeah. sanctifies according to the confessions. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, well, again, I'm going to say reading, personal Bible reading, and preaching is not the same. Uh, it's just not. Um, we, we just have to be careful with that. Um, so <laughs> I know I, I, it makes there's there's a side of it that makes people very uncomfortable. Um, but the act of reading is not what saves you. The act of reading is not what sanctifies you. It's not. Faith is what saves you. Faith in Christ is what saves you. And faith is what sanctifies you. And if that's hearing God's word and believing. Okay. Okay salvation and hearing God's word and being sanctified it's faith all right I've been trying to hold this off so I'm gonna give one illustration and then we're gonna I'm gonna say you gotta go listen to session two and sorry session three and four because I really get into this what's that which will be out which will be out soon in session three I really explain 
kind of um, the role of the church here and in section four, I really explain means of grace. I, it's hard for me to get into all of that right now. It, you, we have to create an entire worldview change. Remember when I, remember when I said in the beginning, your perspective will, will um, drive your purpose. So if your perspective is that my entire world rests in trusting in Christ, um, so my obedience is important, but my obedience comes from a, a position of resting. So I've been saying this a lot lately that I, I, I obey from a resting position. I am resting in the fact that God is good with me. There is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. There's no required righteousness left of me. And by nature, by the power of the spirit, I am going to obey and I desire to obey, but I am obeying from a resting position. A lot of people obey out of fear. A lot of people obey out of guilt. And a lot of people obey out of duty. In other words, it's required for me. I must do it. We, as if we understand rightly our position in Jesus Christ, we obey because of what is done. So here's the illustration I have for you. If I came to you and I said, okay, I'll use Lynn as an example. Lynn, we're going to go down to the LA and we're at Los Angeles. We're going to find people that need help, like legitimately need help. And we're going to take money from your bank account and we're going to go and help those people. Well, first of all, you're like, yes, I want to help people. But secondly, that's my money. I earned it. I worked hard for it and I need that. So no, you can't have my money, but maybe here's a little bit to go do that. So there, there's a side of you that's like, I'm not giving, I'm not departing from that because it belongs to me. Here's a second scenario. I then write you a check for a million dollars and I say, Lynn, now I want you to go and I want you to give this money away and find people who need it. Well, it's so much easier to give away what doesn't belong to you, especially if it's going to do someone good. The only thing it's going to require of you is your time. Unfortunately, in Christianity, we see our righteousness as something we're accumulating. And we are unwilling to allow anybody to touch that because it's something we've worked for and it's ours. And in, in, in some ways, our personal Bible reading and our, and our prayer time is that moment of, hey, listen, I've, I've really accumulated this. And it's important to me and it's valuable to me because it's part of my self-righteousness. It's part of my righteousness. It's, it's, it's what that is. Not in every case, but that's how it feels. So every time you hear that verse uh, from Paul, when he says, you've been bought with a price, now glorify God in your bodies. We feel guilty in that. Like, oh my, oh, okay, yeah, I've been, you bought me. So I guess I'll have to do this. But if you change it and you realize I've been purchased, which means I was in debt, I was in definite guilty for condemnation forever in needing the perfect righteousness. And all of a sudden you wake up and debt gone and you own all the righteousness that you could ever possibly own. Like it's all yours. And then God says, now go give my righteousness away. Go give it away. Or we'll just rephrase it. Glorify God with this. It's no longer guilt, shame, duty. Well, it's not mine. And so from this moment of resting, like I have nothing left to earn. I have nothing left to, to, to do. It's all been done. Now I get to go give God glory and give away his righteousness to other people for the sake of the kingdom. That's the design of it. So what is it that you need to constantly be reminded of? that it's done. You need to be reminded that there's nothing left for you to do. And you, everything has been done for you. So you are constantly receiving to remind yourself of where the flow comes out of. It's faith before faithfulness, right? Done before due. So that's my encouragement to you there. I totally got into preaching. I apologize. Um, and right there, it's nine o'clock. Um, for those of you that want to stick around, I'd be more than happy to answer a couple of questions. Uh, but then Ryan and I have to go because we have an early work tomorrow. <laughs> so I'll answer a couple more. Um, oh, I guess that's it. John Decker says, same time next week. Ryan is up next. <laughs> I'll be on a cruise next week. <laughs> so no. Yes, I will be moving into a new location. But we do plan on doing more of these. I'm glad that you've enjoyed them. And hopefully um, this is helpful for you. Um, I would also say if you're wrestling with this, it's good. It's good to wrestle. 
uh, I would I would equate it to for those of you that are that transition to into a Calvinistic perspective, that first moment you encounter depravity or election, I'm pretty sure you didn't wake up the next morning and just embrace it. It takes time to wrap your head around it. And so my encouragement to you is to continue to work through this. Um, don't give up on your Bible reading. Go find Christ in that, but don't equate your personal standing before God. All righteousness required is already been met. Now rest in it. And from that, discipline yourself so that the godliness that's been granted to you can be flowed out to those around you. And you have to participate that in your church. So if you're not a part of a local church loving the body and receiving Christ, then uh, this is not church. The Theocast is not church. So don't, don't confuse it with that. All right. Well, unless we have any other questions, I think we're going to, we're going to shut it down.